This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Welcome to The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention. As your host, I sit down with a different professional athlete each episode to learn how they create success beyond sports. If you listen to the season one trailer for The Big Jump, yes, this is the episode where I respond to the shut up and dribble comments that made national headlines. And I thought, who better to bring that up with than a current NBA player? So today's guest is Duke national champion and NBA standout Mason Plumlee, a friend of mine who is crushing it on and off the court. Guys have interests off the court, and I think it's good that they pursue that. And I've done the same. We talk about the pressures, stereotypes, and support felt by current athletes when it comes to pursuits outside of their sport. Mason is one of three Plumlee brothers who all play in the NBA. Mason's the middle child, you know, the one that's supposed to be forgotten, but he has the highest player rating of the three. So how'd that happen? I apply Malcolm Gladwell's outlier theory to look at nature versus nurture and illustrate how small differences can have a big impact, a valuable lesson to anyone thinking about reinvention. After the interview, Mason told me he gained new insight on his own brother dynamics that he had never considered before. Though Mason's in the heart of his NBA career, you'll hear his fears about missing the game when it stops, and we discuss tangible strategies for dealing with change and reinvention. Post-career, like, I'm not sure I'll ever feel that rush again. And we get into Mason's wide-ranging business pursuits, as well as why he appeared in a rap video as Plum Dog Millionaire, can't make that up, even though he knew he'd get made fun of. There's a great lesson about making small bets that I got from that story. And you'll hear a heartwarming story from Mason's vast international travels. And on the opposite side of that heartwarming spectrum, the advice Mason would give to himself before starting his freshman year at Duke. For context on that advice, the cage is a dancing cage suspended from the air at a bar called Shooters on the Duke campus. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best and I learn from sports that feedback is love and improves performance. So give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you. So tell me what you liked. Tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show. And leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in L.A. and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean. Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. And with that, I give you my inspiring conversation with Mason Plumley. Mason, thanks for being on The Big Jump, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited uh, to sit down and chat with you today. You know, the theme of this podcast is all about reinventing yourself. And I think one of the keys to reinventing yourself is knowing that it's a hands-on job. It's a proactive job. And so it's up to us to create that for ourselves. You know, it's not something that happens to you. It's something that you do for yourself. And I think one thing that's helpful in figuring out what path uh, we want to take moving forward is to understand the path that we've walked already, what's mm-hmm. led us to this point. Yeah. So I'd like to begin our, our conversation talking about how you grew up. Yeah. And so the question I'd love to start with is what's your earliest memory playing sports? Uh, My earliest memory playing sports, I'm one of four kids. So I have an older brother, Miles, who also plays in the NBA. And we started out playing um, one-on-one, you know, when we were, I don't know, five, six years old in our grandparents' driveway. 
And that's my earliest memory of competition, of fighting, of the the excitement of winning, like all that. So, you know, we may have only got the ball in the hoop one or two times, but if I if I was the one that put it in there, I felt the joy of winning. That's the earliest memory. I love that. Tell me about your uh, the hometown you grew up in. Yeah, I grew up in a small town, Warsaw, Indiana. You know, I was there really from first grade all the way through my freshman year of high school. This is a small Indiana town. Indiana is all about basketball, but the kind of the the base of of Warsaw is orthopedics, and it's the orthopedic capital of the world, which a lot of people don't know. It's very random, but um. So if you need a hip replacement one day, your story's yeah, gonna come full circle. Exactly. So like. <laughs> You know, it was kind of funny to me when I ended up going to Duke, I found out that Coach K was like the lead, the lead endorsee of Depew hips because he has two artificial hips. And I was like, oh, hey, I, I can tell you where those came from. So, <laughs> I love that. So pretty, pretty small town, Indiana, yeah. you know, basketball is a religion essentially in Indiana. Yep. But do, what else did you do besides basketball? Did you dabble in other things? Yeah, kids? there wasn't much to do. I mean, we did... Like, I know when we got bikes, you know, it was really fun to ride through the trails on the bikes. You just tried all the sports. I think sports was big in my hometown because we had a really good little league baseball league. You know, the swim team was was fun. We did the swim team, tennis. We just, you just tried everything. And it was, it was a very fun childhood because, you know, we weren't good at everything, but the same group of kids, we tried everything. So, you know, you may have your day at basketball when upward basketball is going on or, or little kids basketball, but then you go over to the football field and you aren't so good. So it was, it was fun to try different things. What sport did you work the hardest at outside of basketball? Swimming for sure. Swimming was my favorite. You know, I really looking back at it, it was a very hard decision because I pursued, pursued swimming, you know, passionately up until eighth grade. And then you know, once you get into the high school season, you can't do both because swimming's in the winter, basketball's in the winter. And the only way to be truly good at swimming is to be in the pool all the time. So, you know, I could balance it, uh, you know, elementary school, middle school, but then once, once high school started, you had to make that decision. And I, I really enjoyed it because it was so different than basketball. It was an individual sport. You got out what you put in. There was nobody to blame but yourself. And you were always competing against yourself. So, um, I really enjoyed um, that dynamic versus basketball, but, you know, basketball is my passion and my first love. So I, of course, went with that. You can learn a lot about hard work uh, from swimming. Another yeah. previous guest on the big jump, Chris Humphreys, huh. uh, was a, a national ranking youth swimmer, yeah. set a bunch of records, and he said it's the hardest workout you can do. Yeah. And he got a lot of his grit and work ethic from from swimming. What do you think you got from swimming that may have transferred over to basketball? Yeah, I would just say <laughs> putting the time in. Like you said, the the work of it, if you want to be good, two-a-days are the regular training regimen. So it's not like like in basketball, we have two-a-days for training camp as a team anyway for one week. And then after <laughs> that, you know, it's it's more taking care of your body and being in the weight room and the gym and all that. But like swimming you need to be in the pool in the morning and then you need to be in the pool at night and then you fit in the weight training around that so you know to be fair you know I stopped before high school so I never really introduced the weights into to the training of swimming but I was just in the pool all the time and I'm sure as Chris said that's the best way to to improve tell me about your parents and how they related to you vis-a-vis -vis sport what were their backgrounds and what were they like with you yeah. and you know four kids uh, all athletic so my parents, they both played, but, you know, I think a lot of people think because they played, they were forcing basketball on us or, you know, they're always coaching us. You know, my dad never coached any of the teams I played on growing up and he was far more qualified than a lot of people I played for. <laughs> and when you say they played, at what level did your parents yeah, play? Yeah, so my dad played at Tennessee Tech and then he played for Athletes in Action, which at the time, back back in the day, they would go and they would play like pro teams or they'd play college teams. So they would go and play like Duke. Um, they play Purdue, Indiana. And then my mom played at Purdue. So she was in West Lafayette, played for four years. They were very knowledgeable at the game. They had had success with the game, but they didn't force it on anybody. And what I always tell people is I have a little sister and um, she was playing basketball. This was like an elementary school. And, you know, of course, the family, we signed her up. We took her to practice. And she got in the van after one of her practices. And you could tell she was just 
she was not having fun. And my dad just told her, he's like, look, Madeline, if you don't want to play, you don't have to play. And she just started crying and she was like, thank you so much. She's like, <laughs> I don't want to play basketball. He's like, that's fine. Like I had no, I'm just want to introduce you to different sports and see what you like. But yeah, it wasn't forced on us. It was just, they were there if we had questions and uh, I really appreciate how my parents approach sport as opposed to being very involved or almost like helicopter parents in the sports arena. You seem to love it. And you obviously wanted to play as did your brothers. So mm-hmm. when you raised your hand and you're like, I'm in. Yeah. Then how did they relate to you? Because that could be a, yeah. a pretty great advantage to have two, you know, division one basketball parents. Well, I'll tell you the biggest advantage from my parents was was navigating the new grassroots basketball system. I did not want to go away to boarding school. My dad found a school for us in North Carolina, an all boys boarding school for us to go and play, which was like the best decision. He helped me navigate like college recruitment, dealt with a lot of coaches. So I wasn't talking on the phone with coaches all the time. He would talk to the coaches, you know, deciding when to leave college and if I wanted to leave college early. He was very valuable in that respect. You know, he he would always get on the court with us and help us with skill stuff. And um, he was a very good player. So all that was was good. But I would say as a parent, having that that influence in terms of decision making <laughs> career wise was invaluable. So you've mentioned your your siblings here. Yeah. And, you know, it's a it's a big part of who you are because it's a big part of how all of us have come to be who we are. You know, our families shape us. I think people gravitated towards your story because of how rare it is to have three brothers who all won a national championship at Duke and played in the NBA. And I'd like to talk to you more about the sibling dynamic, but not at that face value, not at the novelty thing. Um, You know, I think it's a little bit, I would imagine you've been asked about that about as often as I get asked about my height, (laughs) which is to say it's not a very exciting conversation to me for the 10,000th time. So I'd like to take a little bit of a different lens. And, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other uh, over the last few years. And you're one of the most fascinating examples of an outlier that I could conceive of. There's a kind of a debate, maybe impossible to solve about nature versus nurture. And, you know, there've been books written about outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, and sort of what I took away from that book is genius doesn't matter. Genius is a myth that's overrated. And I think the genius part of the equation for basketball is the genetics So it's like, how much do the genetics matter? And how much is it the environment in which you grew up, the nurture part? So what I'm particularly fascinated by is if you were a scientist in a lab designing a experiment, this is like as close as you could get in real world conditions. You have three brothers, all roughly seven feet tall, who played at the same high school, who played at the same college, and who all went to the NBA. But you guys, even within that elite sliver, have had different levels of success. And I think that beneath the surface, there are some interesting things that I've noticed that might make an argument for nurture. Yeah. So let's start with birth order. Okay. (laughs) Now, walk me through the birth order. Yeah, so Miles was born in 89. There's a year and a half between us. And then Marshall was then born two years after me. So I'm the middle child. And then Madeline quit basketball early. (laughs) (laughs) So while Madeline's important and a tremendous athlete in her own right, a volleyball (laughs) player at Notre Dame, for the sake of this conversation, this Petri dish we're going to examine, we're going to stick to the three brothers. So what I started to think about is with you and uh, Miles being only a year and a half apart, you know, that's almost like Irish twins, right? You guys are... You're in there and you're competing for attention, really, from the parents. And then, you know, a lot of kids who are born that close to one another, like they're trying to kill each other. Yeah. Was it like that for you too? Yeah, that was very much the case. I would say a lot of kids probably would have gone to different schools or I've seen brothers grow up and go to different schools or go to different colleges or try to find their own identity. But we we really stuck together and we didn't always plan on that being uh, how we did it. We actually committed to different universities coming out of high school. A lot of people don't know that. 
But um, yeah, we wanted to kill each other. We weren't really friends until college. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was just like, we were just always with each other, whether it was, you know, swimming, basketball, whatever, you know, our identity became one. It was the Plumley brothers. Um, You know, Marshall, of course, was, he was a little more removed. And I would say, you know, the way we matured physically and whatnot, me and Miles were always uh, competitive and, and in the same, same stride, so to speak. But our identity was the two of us together. It makes a lot of sense because when you think about, you know, you mentioned your earliest memory playing sports and your grandparents, basketball hoop, playing outside, you and Miles trying to kill each other. So you had years of that. And let's say, let's fast forward to even when the youngest Marshall's 10 years old. Well, that means that Miles is 14 and you're 12 and a half. And so it's no fun to play with a 10 year old, right? You're just in such a different place physically. Plus you two have had this rivalry that's like so well baked by that point when you're 14. So in a sense, like Marshall's sort of lagging behind in terms of, you know, the three Plumlee brothers that people think of, and you've all gone on and of course are, you know, made it incredibly far, but I'm trying to tease out kind of the sliver in this nature versus nurture argument in that you all had the same nature. You all come from two division one basketball playing parents and you all even came from a remarkably similar kind of nurture environment, but there are these small differences that may have made the difference. And the reason why I'm focusing in on this is I think when you think about reinventing yourself, being proactive, It's, well, what small differences can I create for myself that might have this little 1% here, 2% here, suddenly that adds up to 10%. And that's the difference between being great and being good. And so um, in thinking about that, the stereotype of the middle child is they're sort of the forgotten one, right? They're the oldest gets all the responsibility and it's kind of the firstborn and gets that attention. But then the youngest comes in and they're the youngest. So they're the cute one and they yeah. demand that attention. <laughs> yeah. And the middle gets left behind. But you don't strike me as a middle child at all in your personality. And then it kind of dawned on me is you guys almost have more of like a twin relationship. Yeah, that's that's a fair way to put it. Although I was younger, I never identified with being the younger brother with me and Miles or the middle child for that matter. I just, I think because sport was so competitive, I just never, I never felt like I was taking a back seat. I think the only time I took a back seat was when discipline was issued. <laughs> like <laughs> when we both did something dumb, I was like, well, he's the whole, you know, I was following <laughs> his lead, but we spent so much time. Uh, we had such an active lifestyle in different sports and everything. Co- competition, you, you don't take a back seat to anyone. So maybe that's why I never identified as a middle child. And that could be the case. Yeah. And didn't you play on the same youth team? So you played up a year. So you were a year behind academically, but sports wise, you played up a year. And I imagine part of that was a smart carpooling arrangement yes, from yeah. your parents. Logistics. Right? You only have to drive around sort of like a yeah. set of quote twins versus two different teams. Exactly. But think about the impact that that might've had on you too. No doubt. I mean, that what you said is exactly true. Like when you have a lot of kids, you are trying to drive them around to four different teams. So me and Miles always played on the same teams in the summer and otherwise. And yeah, it was just, we, we found once we were on the floor together, we found ways to complement each other. But as anybody knows, there's more practice than games. So you're going against each other more than you're on the same side. And it ended up being a really neat uh, relationship as we got older, but you know, yeah, we, we stayed together really until yeah, the one year in high school where he was a freshman in college. And then I had the one year, my senior year of college where he was in the NBA, but I, I feel like I benefited from having a brother. You talk about nature versus nurture. I would say the nurture part of that is, you know, who else would get to grow up with two brothers, the same size to play against and to play with. Um, in the middle of nowhere in Indiana. So, <laughs> you know, you can play a lot of guys that end up, you know, 6'10", 6'11", 7 feet. They haven't played against another guy that size in, in their whole high school career. And I had, you know, two guys in the driveway to do such. I'm teasing out these different kind of elements. And part of it is that the end of this story is that when you look at player rankings in the NBA, you're in the top third of the league. So by those definitions, at least, and, you know, rankings are kind of subjective and put together in different ways, but you're the better ranked player, better regarded player. 
And so I began asking the question, well, how does the middle kid, the one who is supposed to be forgotten, what happened where he's the one who turns out a little bit better? So I think birth order, right, uh, in that move of you basically becoming a twin of sorts, playing up a year where you're playing against better competition. And then I think there's something interesting when you think about fifth and sixth grade, you're likely you're playing up a year, but then you're smaller because the other kids are a year and a half or even closer to two years developmentally older than you. So did you start off as a big man or a guard? Actually a guard. I had the ball in my hands a lot. That was one of the benefits of playing up is, you know, although I was, I was younger, I got to play, although I was taller for my age with the group I was playing with, I was just very average height. So um, I got the ball in my hands a lot more, but I would say, you know, to your point about being the middle child, I felt like I've had the psychological advantage of, I've been able to watch miles, especially in those transition years, like, you know, middle school to high school, high school to college, college to the NBA, where I've had an insight to, you know, what is freshman year of college? Like, what is the, you know, the NBA workouts before you get drafted? What is training camp like on an NBA team? And, you know, Miles has kind of been like going over the hill, taking all the arrows and I get to learn from that. And then also I get the role of like mentorship to my little brother. So then, you know, I'm learning from Miles, you know, obviously you have your own experience and you learn from it, but then also, you know, I can reinforce kind of my beliefs and what I've learned with Marshall by sharing with him. So I've always felt like a beneficiary of being a middle child. And I feel like it's the most advantageous position to be in. And I wouldn't trade it for anything, but you know, Miles didn't play his entire rookie year. So uh, he was a first round pick. I think there was only two or three picks difference between me and him, but he was a first round pick by the Pacers and he basically watched for a whole season. So, you know, I was able to come in and after talking to him and kind of seeing how the league worked a little bit, you know, I had a different approach than I would have otherwise. And I was able to, to play my whole rookie year. So, you know, I, I think the, the nurture part that you talk about, you have, you have somebody who's been through it and understands, you know, what goes into a successful career in pro sports. And I think that's very valuable too. And that's something that's new for our family, but I had that with miles every step of the way. Right. You could almost draft off of him in a sense. Yeah. Where like, you know, if you're a cyclist, like he's riding first exactly, and you're saving energy and sort of seeing the turns ahead, one move ahead. And then I love though, also what you said, about then how you could relate your own experience down to your younger brother, Marshall, because a great way to learn is to actually teach. Teach. Yes. Yes. And so that's really powerful where you, you were able to have both things sort of just in the position of the pack that you were in. So you had that sliding door moment where it seems like you were basically going to keep drafting off of Miles. Yeah. So we, Miles committed to Stanford. I committed to Duke and it was like, okay, now we're finally doing our own thing. The coach from Stanford uh, took a different job. Then one of the players at Duke, Taylor King, transferred out of Duke. So then a scholarship opened up. So Coach K is like, hey, you think your brother will want to come play here? I was like, yeah, probably if you ask him. (laughs) And uh, so they went and they got Miles and and there we are back together again. So... (laughs) Even when we tried to split up, it it didn't it didn't happen. So. <laughs> he guys are rubber banded together. Yeah, yeah. Playing for Coach K, who's known as a smart psychological coach, or, you know, potentially into the mind game territory. Did he pit you against your brother in terms of competing for playing time? Um, I mean, that was definitely you know whether he pitted us or not. We, there was plenty of time where Duke only had one big guy on the floor, so. You know, there's just the reality of how we played. We played small and there's one spot up for minutes. So, um, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, I, I can't say, but we realize, look, we're, we're competing for, for the minutes and for the time and, and for the touches. And, you know, it was good though. I think it is, it's a little harder when it's family. Cause even when you have, when you have success, if you have it at the expense of family, it's tough, but we have a a relationship to where he could be happy for me and I could be happy for him. And, and the, the counter side to that is, you know, I could, if I didn't play well, miles had a great game. Sometimes I felt like I played well, so (laughs) it works both ways. So you likely could have left after your sophomore year uh, for the NBA. Uh, You made a decision. uh, Well, I guess 
two decisions. Twice, yeah, <laughs> I, I kept going back. Yeah, yeah. How much did Coach K influence that decision? He influenced it a lot my first time coming back. Because the whole, everything was around, you're not ready, you're not ready. The second time, after my junior year, that was all my decision. You know, I had a lot of people, uh, parents, uh, you know, coaches, a lot of people telling me I should leave. And, uh, you know, they expected me to leave too. So uh, I think I I surprised the staff when I told them I wanted to come back. You know, I have have no regrets. I love that I spent four years. My senior year was my most enjoyable year competing. The team that I was on, my teammates, all that. But again, going back to like, I didn't have any influence in my life. That was a former NBA player. And when you look at guys who they realize like, Hey, it doesn't really matter how I'm going to play my freshman year. I'm an NBA player. I'm leaving after my freshman year. I was also sitting there on draft night. Like here, the, you know, the college coaches have voted me the best big man in college basketball. And I watch, I think seven or eight centers get taken ahead of me on draft night. And I'm like, well, wait, now hold on. Like I played against all you guys and we're, like, why am I going, you know, 22nd or whatever? And like, I didn't realize how much of a premium was put on the age. So what's crazy is I, you know, my numbers and my play was consistently better freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior, junior to senior. But then I come out as a 22 year old and an NBA team looks at a kid at 19 and they're like, well, we can get him in our system and develop him how we want and we can turn him into the player we want him to be. But one of the biggest things about the draft is like, you know, age <laughs> and, and a bunch of, you know, 18, 19 year olds are, are selected higher, even if they didn't have the book of work. What was going through your mind or what kind of emotions were you feeling watching all those other centers going before you? I mean, it, it was not comfortable. <laughs> it was, I thought I would go a lot higher than, than I was selected, but you learn very quickly and to anybody out there that's about to be drafted. Once you're drafted, the situation is so much more important than the number you're picked at. Of course, there's the pay scale and there's all that. And, you know, everybody wants to sit in the green room, but, you know, I had a chance to make the all rookie team because I went to a team that had no youth. We had the oldest team in the league. Everybody got hurt and I got to play right away. And, um, you know, sometimes, the money's good and all, but at the end of the day, we're players and we want to play. And, um, you know, I just felt so fortunate that I was drafted where I was because I went to a team that needed me right away and um, it couldn't have been a better situation. Yeah, that was a really remarkable uh, Brooklyn Nets team yeah. that you played on with all those veterans. Yeah. How much pressure did you feel to be solely committed to basketball in yeah. terms of are you – you know, going into the NBA and, uh, you know, I want to get into your, your interests and pursuits outside of basketball. Where's the room for kind of plan B or outside pursuits, given the kind of model of um, being solely focused? Well, you definitely need balance. I think, you know, like Paul Pierce would always tell me, he's like, look, he's like, give it all you have while you're here. You know, we'd be in the weight room early. He'd say, you know, weight room, film on the court. Uh, treatment. He said, give it all you have while you're here. He's like, but once you leave, he's like, let it go. He's like, you can't carry the game with you everywhere. You'll go nuts and, um, and you need some balance. He's like, I don't care. He he gave a lot of examples of hobbies or activities that you could do (laughs) outside of the court. He's like, but you got to find something. And I know we talked a little bit about this the other day, but you know, up until, up until you make it to the NBA, everybody's message is, you know, college coaches, parents, whatever, focus on your game, focus on your game, focus on your game. Well, all of a sudden you get to the NBA and you can only, physically, you can only um, pursue the game so many hours in the day. So, you know, all of a sudden you don't have class, you don't have other obligations and there's a lot of free time. There's a lot of downtime. So, you know, I've tried a lot of different things. I've been in the league five years now, um, you know, to, to challenge myself to stay stimulated what kind of messages would you get from coaches around plan B's or side pursuits? Yeah. You know, the, the NBA, like you, you develop really good relationships, whether it be with an assistant or, you know, somebody in the front office or something where, you know, you'll go out to dinner, you'll talk about different things, but you're really on your own. I mean, it doesn't matter what age you come into the league. They only care about what you're doing when you're on the court. Oh, I shouldn't say that. 
they aren't going to give you like, hey, you should go do this or try that or whatever. Now, our players union, they for they present a lot of opportunities. Um, if you want to get involved in, you know, charity, if you want to go like their real estate symposiums or their franchising classes. And there's a lot of downtime with travel. So you do, I, I think everybody has interests, whether they're public or not. Even, you know, I know KG had a lot of business interests. I know Paul Pierce was already pursuing some of the the television and stuff that he's doing now, but guys have interests off the court. And I think it's good that they pursue that. And I've done the same. It sort of seems like the NBA transition planning starts almost at day one where they're yeah. talking to you about transitions. Yeah. When they tell you the average career is five years, you start thinking really quick. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned that um, some of your teammates take a lot of heat yeah. for some of the kind of side things <laughs> that they you know are taking on while they're playing. So it seems like a little bit of a double standard to me where they're like, uh, yeah. hey, start thinking about a transition now, but don't start doing your transition now on a parallel path. Yeah. So me and David were talking before I hopped on on the mic. I even heard a funny, like I was watching Jonas Yurebko play uh, this past season and they're like, oh yeah, Yurebko. They're like, yeah, I just bought into an e-gaming franchise. And Jeff Van Gundy's like, what? He's like, get in the gym. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> But even like, I think if you were to talk to Jeff Van Gunny, it's like, all right, you can, we're in the gym. We're working on our game. That is, you know, that's why we're here. We didn't get here, you know, by focusing on a bunch of different things, but you do need things to, to keep you uh, interested to, to challenge yourself off the court too, because you're only on the court so many hours in a day. Damian Lillard, you know, one of my favorite teammates has a rap career. He has his own music label and, you know, he's pursued that, you know, really since he left college. And I see sometimes these people comment or criticize him and tell him, oh, you know, you should be working on your game or you should be doing this or you should be doing that. And all this, mind you, coming from non-basketball players. <laughs> but I'm looking at it like, okay, well, Damian was first team all NBA this year. So if they're going to criticize him for pursuing music, I can't imagine what they're about to say about me. And I've always found that other activities off the court were additive to me. Yeah. You know, it's, I would learn something and I would be able to apply it back to basketball or vice versa. I'd take something from basketball and apply it to a side pursuit. I think there is though some, I think within the basketball culture and, and certainly from fans looking in this pressure or almost a want to see athletes as these two dimensional creatures or they want to see basketball players. They want to see athletes for their physicality and for their performance and want to know nothing of their ideas and interests and what else they might be able to be successful in. You know, when I, we were hanging out the other day and I first told you about the, the concept for this podcast and it's about reinventing yourself and how do you leverage your athletic mind for success beyond sports? You know, the first thing that you mentioned was shut up and dribble. Yeah. Yeah. Right? This is still being said. This is still uh, a way that a significant percentage of the population thinks about athletes as these sort of two dimensional creatures. Yeah. And I don't know if it must make people uncomfortable or maybe people are just so, so passionate about their sports team. They feel like if you're only concerned with the trailblazers 24 seven, that, that there'd be a better product on the floor. I don't know what they think, but there's definitely, I mean, like anything, there's a balance to life. Like you can't, you know, you can't only be a family man because if you don't go out and work, you won't have any money to provide for your family. So if you're going to work out, you need to rest. If you're going to, you know, there's just, there's balance. So you, there, there is more to players. Um, you know, the more locker rooms I'm in, the more teammates I have, it, it is awesome to see guys, different interests, um, whether it be philanthropic, whether it be charitable, whether it be business, whatever it is like guys, have a lot to offer and that's a good thing because you you can only play the game till you're 40 years old so then you have you know a lot of a lot of years after that where you're going to want to be pursuing something or you're going to want to be you know changing lives and and I think it's great that you know the NBA and you know teams and our players union has embraced that and and they want to help guys in those pursuits yeah. And I think players are on an eve of kind of a new era where you're allowed to be vocal about other pursuits where it's not seen as a detractor or, you know, will people think less of me if I'm also successful at something in addition to my sport at the same time? 
And I really feel like it's on the cusp of being seen that way. Cause my belief is that athletes are gifted people are talented people, period. And because they're a talented person, they've chosen to apply that gift in a first act of life, which is sport and see success that way. They're fully capable and qualified of applying that talent, that gift towards other areas of life and doing well there as well. And so I think, you know, it's, it's people from the outside that want to keep boxing athletes into these two dimensional roles, right? Like the, the shut up and dribble thing that Laura Ingraham said, that's if I walked up to her and was like, Hey, Laura Ingraham, shut up and smile. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's just like, we athletes don't want to be known only for our physicality any more than she would want to be known only for her physicality. Um, and I learned later that Laura Ingraham and I uh, both went to Dartmouth. She's 20 years older than I am. She should know better, but I hope I run into her at a reunion so we can have a conversation about this. But I really think it's time for uh, people to start viewing athletes as like whole and complete people who are talented and can add a lot of value to the world. Yes, with their sport and the impact that that creates in the world, but in other areas as well. So tell me this, because you've done I know I'm being interviewed here, but I'm interested because you've done a few of these now. Ever since I've gotten into the NBA, I've considered this. What what do you see as a consistent thread in a successful transition? Or, you know, what has gotten guys in trouble in pursuing things post-career or during career? Just in terms of like, I don't know, like, for example, I know like Kurt Schilling, he pursued the video game thing. It seemed like he put all his finances and time into one video game and it flopped. And then, you know, is that successful or not? I don't know. Maybe he learned something from that that will take him on to the next video game that will be a success. I don't know. But what do you see from these athletes that has been good in that transition? That's a great question. One of the things that I'm seeing is diversification of identity. So if someone has their entire identity wrapped up in their sport and only their sport, when that goes away, that's tremendously more traumatic than if someone has other areas of their life that are also built up. So, you know, I think of it like, I mean, you grew up around lakes in the Midwest, just like me. And if you have a raft in the middle of the lake and there are four barrels beneath it that are making it float, if one of those barrels takes on water, you still have the other three yeah. to have it float. So, you know, the singular identity thing, that's like a single barrel, you know, that's keeping a raft afloat. And so understandably, when that goes away, it's, it's, it's very traumatic. I think Steve Nash de- said depressing it, almost. it is depressing. I've talked to a lot of former players who were like, yeah, I was just depressed for the first couple of years because I was always so-and-so the football player or yeah so that makes a lot of sense yeah it's a difficult position to be in it's also a privileged position to be in and that's part of actually what makes it difficult I think to speak up about that it is difficult from what I've found athletes are shy to speak up about how difficult it can be while they're in it and while they might be feeling those things because they feel like well I'm in this privileged position, you know, I should be so lucky to feel depressed sort of a thing, but like your feelings are your feelings. And, you know, the time that you're going through is the time you're going through. I mean, I've heard it from a lot and it's not easy for people. And so I think also like one goal of this podcast is for people not to feel alone in their transition and knowing that it's pretty normal to feel some sense of loss when the sport's over, whether that be any level of elite athlete division one or any kind of an NCAA athlete, professional national team, like there is some sense of loss when the sport goes away. What I think makes it easier is if there are other aspects of your identity that you're in love with, you know, that you love this other part of your life or these other parts of your life is something that I think eases that difficulty. I'd be interested if you ask the people, like, especially the ones that have already retired, like, what do you miss most? Because I've heard just, you know, through friends and uh, panels and hearing people ask that, it seems like it's different things for different people. Like I know, like I was talking to Brian Erlacher and he's like the camaraderie of the locker room. Like there's no, there's no work environment that you're going to go into that's going to be like a locker room. Like you, anything goes, anything, you know, you can say whatever, you can make fun of everybody in the room. Like, you know, I can't imagine showing up to a, a, a group of cubicles and just cracking on everybody before we got the day started, you know? And then like other people, it'll be like, 
you know, like other football players, it's literally the the rush of when you run onto the field. Like there's there's a very real adrenaline, and I felt it too, especially like in the playoffs. Unless I have some hidden, you know, musical talent that's going to put me on stage in front of twenty thousand people post career, like I'm not sure I'll ever feel that rush again. And I wonder, you know, if if identifying what you miss most and then pursuing that in another arena, if that's possible. But I just always think about that because, you know, some people, they, they really do enjoy the the challenge of, of a team dynamic and, and connecting with everybody from the last player on the bench to the star player and get, getting everybody on the same page. Some people miss, you know, just the fans, just, you know, like I, we were with a Shaq in China one preseason and he loves the fans. Like some guys, like they won't sign by the end of their career, especially on that Brooklyn team, they wouldn't sign autographs. They wouldn't take pictures. They wouldn't. Shaq loves it. Like he loves people running up to him. So like, I think for everybody, there are elements of sport that they miss more than others. And I wonder if being self-aware of what that is could help in that transition. What do you think it will be for you? Hopefully you've got many years left in your your career you're off to a great start and presumably have some runway ahead of you what do you think you'll miss most i think it'll be the the adrenaline like i'm not an adrenaline junkie i'm not into extreme sports or anything like that but when you're in those moments like some of the best feelings to me in my pro career have been like when we beat the raptors in the first round of the playoffs or we beat the clippers in the first round of the playoffs you get chills because they're especially the Clippers series because nobody expected us to win and you could feel a game six we felt felt like we were about to win and there were just big plays made down the stretch you have you have an arena just going crazy and there's nothing and you're at center stage like I so I had free throws to close out the Clippers in that first round and you know the feeling after hitting those free throws is like you can't you can't buy that feeling you can't you can't replicate it and I think you know, my goal in my career is to have as many moments like that as I can before it's done, because it's not so sure that you could ever have an arena full, a nation full watching on TV react to, to what you do. So to me, that's, that's probably the most enjoyable or the most unique thing about, about, uh, an athletic career. I think you're right in that you're likely not going to be able to replicate those or replace them, which is part of, you know, the bad news of it. And the definition of sadness is the loss of a pleasure. And I think where people get into trouble, um, where I've seen myself get into trouble, is trying to fill that loss with something else. Uh, On another podcast, uh, folks want to go back and listen to it, um, NHL veteran Brooks Like got some great advice from Steve Young that said, acknowledge the sport for what it was. Be grateful that you were able to experience that. Don't try to replicate that elsewhere. Take it for a period of time. Be grateful for it. Look at it fondly and and move on. Know that you have the experience, but but move on and don't try to fill that gap with something else. Something from my own experience is I've also noticed a shift earlier on out of my transition. And when you talk about like those moments, like I still have them for me too, you know, playing pro basketball in Europe is different than a crowd in the NBA. But I even think back to big high school games. Oh yeah. And high, there are high moments school are better because the, because the arena is smaller and you can hear everything. I'm with you. Totally agree. And it's like when you were talking about that moment, I, I was thinking about for me, you know, I still like physiologically, I'm looking at my arms right now and I have goosebumps thinking about a high school game, however many 20 years ago or however long that was. And uh, that's still in me. It'll still be in you. That's there. But I think chasing that feeling is, I think, kind of is a little bit of a fool's errand. (laughs) And, you know, I've found that if you think about intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. So Uh extrinsic motivation is what's going to get the crowd to cheer for me. Yeah. Or what can I do that are going to, that's going to put points up on the scoreboard. Mm versus intrinsic motivation is what brings me joy? What's my passion? Am I following my curiosity? And earlier out of my transition, and maybe it was because I was early transitioning out of pro sports, maybe it's because I was younger, I was definitely going for more extrinsic things where how much revenue can my company have? How many employees, you know, can we have on the payroll? And like, that was my scoreboard. 
And I was really chasing that and trying to drive the numbers up more and more like at any cost. And I was paying less attention to intrinsically what makes me feel good, what brings me fulfillment. And so I've started to make some changes in the last few years that it feels like I'm living from more of like an intrinsically driven place or they call it like an, an internal locus of control where it's like my decisions are based on like what makes me feel good, not based on how I think others will react to me. Right, right. That's a good point. And what's dangerous about doing it for for the outside world is there's always going to be critics and there's always going to be, wouldn't matter what you, I mean, I just looked at James Harden had arguably one of the best seasons in NBA history, number one seed, best record in the league, MVP. And I look on online today and people are saying, you know, Harden can't deliver and Harden can't do this and Harden can't do that. I'm like, look, the man just, <laughs> he just, went, you know, as great as he was and as great of a season as he had, Golden State is one of the best teams in NBA history. Like, what are you going to do? So, yeah, it's almost, there. there's always a critic and there's always someone to tear down what you, what you have achieved. So <laughs> I like that point that you make there about what, what makes you happy and what uh, fulfills yourself. On the topic of diversifying identity, you've got quite a few irons in the fire. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're an active NBA player having a successful career, but you're also motivated to try your hand at quite a number of different things simultaneously. So I'd like to touch on on some of those and hear, you know, what uh, what makes you tick and why you're why you're trying these different things. One of the things that you've started is Founder Fridays, your web series. Uh, tell me about that. My buddy came to me a couple of years back and he wanted to do a website and I kind of wanted to use my platform to much like you are to to shine the light on other people and what they're doing. And actually it started with like an inspiration section. So just highlighting people that were really good at, at what they do that may not, you know, be on it featured in a magazine or get national attention, but it was just a way to to highlight them. And then, you know, what I found through a series of small investments is I was getting inspired a lot by these different founders, their ideas, um, you know, their inspiration for doing what they do. So we just wanted to capture that in a short video, introduce them and their companies to the world and uh, give them something um, like a fun platform to, to basically speak their vision. What new skills do you think you've gotten from becoming a host for the first time? Well, it's, I'll tell you what, the first one was hard. Like I naturally enjoy asking questions more than being asked. So it's a developing skill, but it's something that I enjoy interviewing people. Also, like I had no clue how much goes into like video editing and like, I'm not the one producing the videos, but there's a lot that goes into all these, like all the YouTube stars and <laughs> all these like mini series. So um, I'm gaining an appreciation for that. That's great. It's a great skill to develop. I mean, this is my first time being a host too, with this pursuit with the big jump. Um, and I'm learning a lot from it. Like, uh, learning a lot about preparation and asking questions. And after just glancing at your notes, you're far more prepared than I am going into the Founder Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have a hit list. Like, tell me what you are, what you're doing, how you got started. <laughs> David's done his research here for this interview. So <laughs> you guys got a good host. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that, Mace. You're doing a lot of other things that don't require much money at all. And I want to highlight that also for you know, other people listening. And one of the, one of the interesting things that I hadn't thought about a ton before beginning this podcast is that on the spectrum of pro athletes in all the different sports, there's also a really wide spectrum of income associated, right? Uh, in, in all these different sports. And the listeners of this podcast are, are people who have a growth mindset first and foremost. Many will have a athletic mindset as well. And, you know, experience being an athlete but I've noticed that you do a lot of things and maybe speaking to the people who don't have as much capital to put to work, you do a lot of things that require little money, but you really put yourself out there. So, you know, putting your phone number out into the world, tell me about like some of those things where it's less of like a financial risk, but it just seems like you're putting yourself out there or rap video, right. you know, the plum dog millionaire. <laughs> One of the things I admire about you is how you take risks by putting yourself out there. I forgot about the rap video. <laughs> you know, what's funny is, uh, here, I'm going to recommend a book. I didn't even finish all the way, but I, I read half a book okay. <laughs> called little bets 
And it talked about like how these big companies, they get in the way of themselves because if it doesn't move the bottom line, a hundred, $200 million, $500 million, it doesn't make a difference. And it really gets in the way of their innovation of them being disruptive. The startups are the ones that are really changing things. And that's kind of like how I viewed some of these, like you talk about the rap video. I had no aspirations of a rap career. To me, that was just like a fun project, but you know, I'll, I'll give things a chance. I'll, I'll give things a try and, and they aren't all financially motivated. You know, a lot of it is just to challenge myself. Like the rap video, I was like, it was something that was uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, <laughs> but that's what I liked about it. I was like, you know what? I'm not good at this, but I'm going to give it a go because I lit- I went to pick up my buddy and he was recording in the studio. And, you know, I think we all we all have wanted to be in a studio or on TV or, or do different things. So I was like, you know, even though I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to try it and see where it goes. And, you know, after, after making a, vu- a music video, I, I hung it up, <laughs> I hung up the mic, but. Well, the, the win in that is the doing, you know, the win in that is not, are you now a successful rapper? The win in that is you had a growth mindset. You took a risk and growth comes from getting uncomfortable. No one grows by staying comfortable the whole time. It's the same principle of being in a weight room. If you're in there and you barely break a sweat and you're not feeling some pain, you're probably not improving. The same thing goes for, you know, reinventing yourself and, you know, creating a new identity. You got to try things. I love how you took the little bets idea that corporations can do and you, and you applied that to yourself. But, you know, the, the magic happens when you get outside your comfort zone. It doesn't mean that you're killing yourself. You're not, yeah, you know, no you're not, bad. you're not crushing yourself, but getting uncomfortable is really important. Your mind opens up, you try different things. It almost doesn't matter if it works or not. It's just like, it's in the and, doing. I know. And, and honestly, like I can sit here today and say, I'm, I don't regret that I did it. I mean, and I remember I, I saw an interview before I did that rap video. It was like Will Smith talking about like, he said, I started attacking things that I was afraid of. And I thought about it. I was like, when my buddy was like, oh, do this rap song. And I knew already he had complex lined up to release it. He had like all these people. I was like, I'm afraid what people are going to think. I was like, I'm afraid that my rhymes are not going to be cool or like the music video is going to be whack or whatever. So then I just did it because I was afraid of it. So yeah, like I love your point about growth and and being uncomfortable. And I think we should all, because cause like once I'm 50 years old, I'm definitely not doing it. So, <laughs> so now, I, you know, I have one rap video I can always point to and say, hey, you know what? I tried it and it is what it is now. And I bet that served you in other ways. I bet your first Founder Fridays video was easier because you had done this rap video. For sure. For um, sure. So you never know how these like wins and getting uncomfortable and these micro things, you do enough of those every day you do something uncomfortable, that compounding effort adds up to a lot over time versus just staying in a comfort zone. Yes. And tell me more about, um, you're putting together an investment fund. Tell me about that. I've been interested in real estate ever since somebody gifted me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's all about passive income and what is, what does true wealth look like? And, you know, obviously we make a lot of money in the NBA and, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how to be a good steward of that money. And instead of just spending it, which I do as well, (laughs) um, you know, making the money work for you. So I got into real estate when I was playing for Brooklyn. I did some small single family home projects, some, some rehab projects. And then when I moved out to Portland, um, I became good friends with a developer and a contractor who leads one of the biggest construction outfits in the Northwest. And he introduced me to large scale development. And he let me invest in some of his commercial office projects. And the investment was good. And, you know, I get paid a return and, and the money is what it is. But what was more valuable is he sat me down. He took me through a pro forma. He showed me, you know, what, what FAR means. He took me through, you know, the underwriting. He took me through, you know, all, all the things that the financing of the building, like it was basically an education, a a one-on-one education. And it really taught me how, how generational wealth is accrued and how an asset like he was allowing me to invest in is, is valuable in your portfolio. And I felt fortunate one, you know, anybody off the street couldn't have been invested in the project he was developing. I just happened to have the relationship. So I felt fortunate about that. And I went to him and I said, Hey, Joel, would you mind if my brother's invested as well? 
in your next development? I said, you know, they're both in the NBA and they have some money. And he was like, that's a great idea. I, you know, would love to let them invest and, you know, I'll let you know when the next project comes up. Well, he comes back to me then and he's like, I have a better idea. He's like, why don't we just start a fund and open it up to all athletes? And the thinking being, you know, we make the majority of our money between 20 and 30, 20 and 35. And then, you know, your 401k doesn't start until you're 60, but let's afford the flexibility and the opportunity to pursue what we want post-career. Let's not feel like we have to take a job um, for financial reasons because we need income right away after we retire. And that's, you know, real estate is money working for you while you sleep. So, you know, not to say that every project's going to be a hit, but I can tell you our approach is large scale urban core development. So buildings that will, will pay into perpetuity. And we are an evergreen fund, which has been organized for athletes because it is a different investor base. And we don't need, a lot of funds have like a five, seven or 10 year horizon. We don't want to cash out because once you have a good asset and you're in a good location, you want to hold that and we want the passive income. So we just tailored it specifically to athletes because that was why we were pursuing this in the first place. You know, one of the things I've noticed about you is that while you may kind of think of, hey, this is a good idea, you know, it goes along with the, you know, advice given in, in a, a book like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it's a good asset for me to have, that you're also very interested in these different irons in the fire, and it's a diverse set of things. So there, there's real estate, you also are an investor, or are an investor in Aloe Water brand detox water, and that was one of the things that struck me is when you came over to the color jar office to do a, a branding brainstorm around detox water. I was like, okay, you didn't just stick your money over here and like, you know, place a bet in the casino. It seems like a big part of why you're doing this is because you're curious and you want to learn and it stimulates you in some way. Definitely. And, and going back to the point of all the free time in the day, it does give me, you know, a challenge or something to, to, uh, to work on when I'm not on the court. I think now it's like trying to find the balance of how can I be supportive or assist without getting in the way? Because sometimes I find myself asking so many questions. They're like, all right, Mason, don't just don't worry about this. Let us let us run with it. And but it, it is very fun for me. It's an education. And, you know, if if I believe in in uh, the people behind it or the product, it, it can be a very, a very fun endeavor. And that's what I found with the real estate that's what I found with, with the aloe water and also knowing what you don't know is important and, um, you know, not overstepping and, and really trusting the people who do it for a living. It's a fun way to learn. And obviously money gives you opportunity and access to some of these things. You know, one of the things that I've noticed that you enjoy quite a bit is travel and you've got an adventure streak in you as well. And you and I first met in Vietnam yeah. of all places. Yeah. And, you know, I was there, um, was really fortunate to be asked by the U.S. State Department to give a speech on branding at the U.S. consulate for a bunch of young Asian entrepreneurs. Talk about the circumstances of, of how you were in Vietnam and, you know, why we met that first time. So I was over there with the MBA to put on a junior MBA clinic. So it was like three days. Um, these kids had worked all year through different camp, various camps and earned the right to come and go to this junior MBA clinic in Vietnam. And we had a great three days and it was a chance for me to see the world. And obviously we, you know, we met up there and, and we've been friends since, but, you know, I do like to take advantage of in, every opportunity to, to travel and to see what else is out there. And I'm sure anybody that's traveled will tell you it can be a moving experience. You see, you know, how fortunate we are here in the U S but also you learn a lot. Um, you're exposed to a lot of different ideas, religions, businesses, like just the exposure, it, it, it opens your mind and it's a great thing. Have you done that in other parts of the world? You know, after the first couple of years now, I kind of travel and I'll ask the NBA if they want to jump in on what I'm doing. So like last year we went to Africa, South Africa, from Johannesburg on down to Cape town. And like we did a, you know, our clinic in, in South Africa, I visited Indonesia you know, I did a basketball camp in Dubai last year. I think I'm going back this year. So I've traveled a lot, but, you know, I, we were looking at, at a map earlier. There's there's so much of the world to see. Mm. And, uh, you know, I just feel fortunate that at a young age, I'm able to travel and see see different cultures and, and what's out there. Yeah, it's a really powerful experience. That was 
actually probably my favorite part of playing pro basketball in Europe was just the opportunity to live in Europe and to feel that, you know, I think we're raised with a pretty ethnocentric view of the world is like it revolves around the U.S. and you very quickly learn that that is not true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, other parts of the world are getting along just fine and think about us very <laughs> rarely. Um, so even that alone, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of, I think, the what can be learned from traveling. It's such a mind expanding opportunity. And the other thing that I love about it, especially traveling, traveling overseas, is it allows you to kind of zoom back from your life it gets me out of the day to day and able to take more of a, a, a 30,000 foot view of my own life and evaluate what I think is working, what's not working and kind of clears up some headspace. Yeah. Like I'm jealous because you got, you got to go and live there for a whole year. I feel like we're, you know, as, as a traveler, sometimes you, you cheated a little bit because each area you, you visit, you should give it the time to get to know it. And to fully understand it, you know, my stuff is always a week here and there, but we were in uh, Bali and we were doing a hike up a volcano. We met at the bottom of the mountain at like two in the morning. Cause it was like a five, six hour hike. So we, we hike up, but we had a tour. It was me and my buddy Joel. And then we had a tour guide and then this little girl, she followed us, but she wasn't like with the tour guide, but they knew each other, but she had a backpack on and she just followed us up the mountain. And we're like, all right, I guess, guess she's watching our back or something <laughs> I and mean, she couldn't have been about fourth or fifth grade and you know it was just nice to have her along so we get to the top of the mountain me and Joel are exhausted we, <laughs> we barely make it we were waiting them for the sunrise um we had each brought a water bottle we we drank them like a quarter of the way up but this little girl opened up her backpack and she had you know water bottles sodas like all this stuff to sell to us and we're like oh my god we're like give us everything so we you know we paid her and then she went on back down the mountain and the guy told us like, we're like, she's not even going to stay for the sunrise. Like we just did all this work. She's not even going to enjoy the moment. And she, he was like, Oh, well she comes up and, and sells her, her water bottles at the top to pay for her school that she's going to. And this girl was in like, she was like fourth grade or something. So she's paying for her own education. And it was like a big labor to go up and down that mountain each day. He was like, yeah, he's like, school's not like, it's not available to everyone here. Like you have to pay for it. And that just like was like a wow moment to me. What did you take from that? One, how fortunate we are to, you know, what hard work looks like. I think we all put pride in our work and we all view that we're working hard, but, you know, really to get ahead in some of these other countries, like that was just to get the education she was doing that. And he said that was an everyday thing for her. And, you know, <laughs> it was just, it was moving obviously at that young age, you know, it was, it was a monumental effort for me to get out of bed and make the bus on time to go to my free school and have a free lunch. And, <laughs> and, uh, it was just moving. So that's what like experiences like that are why I love to travel. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It puts a lot in perspective. Yeah. Very quickly. No doubt. So I'd like to wrap up, um, with a few more rapid fire questions. What aspect of yourself are you currently working on? Currently working on. So with the travel and with everything going on, I, I really want to focus on routine. I think that consistency and approach, um, like diligence and focus could, you know, I want to make some changes in my game. And I think, you know, just my off season work habits and having routine around it could really lend itself to that. I think in this, you know, part of, we talk about all the opportunity, the travel and everything is like, I want to find some semblance of of a routine and all that. So that's, that's what I'm focused on really this off season going into next year. Any aspects of routine that you've been experimenting with that you're enjoying? I think it all starts. I, I set a date in my calendar, June 4th, I moved to New York and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I got a lot of travel and experience on the front end of the summer and I'll do one trip on the back end, but just being in one spot, <laughs> you know, I'm sure, you know, running your company, the travel, it, it can wear on you. So I'm looking forward to like, you know, I moved in right next to the gym I'm going to work out at, but I'll be there for two, three months where it's just, I have a routine and, and that's kind of like what I had as a kid. And after doing something over and over and over again, you get into the real nuances and the details of it. And that's what I'm looking forward to. That's great. If you could wake up with one new ability tomorrow, what would it be? Man, one new ability to just stretch it, to stretch a day. If I could like 
stretch a day like 10 more hours, that would be a great ability. Or shorten it if it's a bad day. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just may, all right, t- today was 12 hours. That's all we needed for, for May 28th, and we're good. You're looking for a, a remote control for life. I think yeah, Adam Sandler click, made that, click, yeah. that movie, didn't he? Then we um, for sure. And then finally, what advice would you have for your freshman year at Duke version of Mason? Enjoy college. I was looking at the, as soon as I got to college, I was like, oh man, I can't wait to be to the NBA. I would have enjoyed college. That'll happen when it's supposed to happen, but get the most out of each season, each class. Um <laughs> probably would have done a little more in class you know but part of it too is going to I was a good student in high school but I didn't speak up in class for the first two years you know even if you if you don't know what you're talking about just speaking up and and letting people know you don't know or or engaging the teacher a little bit could be helpful you might have hopped into the cage at shooters a few more times yeah yeah, I definitely (laughs) definitely got in the cage like look, look I always say try anything once except some of these drugs out there they'll they'll get you but um, yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll try anything within reason. And, uh, you know, going back to the little bet, bets point, I think it's, it's good. I was not comfortable in the cage, but I did it because, you know, it's, you got to try things. You know, I think it goes back really to your theme of being willing to take small bets, uh, being willing to experiment, to push yourself outside your comfort zone. And I think those are things that will serve you, you know, they're serving you now. And certainly as you think about continuing your reinvention and how do you leverage your athletic experience beyond sports? It's like, that's the sort of thing that I think will, will really uh, continue to push you along and take you far. For sure. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, Mace. Thanks so much, man. Where um, can people find you online if they want to connect with you? Where are you most active? I'm most active, honestly, through my website, masonplumley.com. Um, we have a lot of neat stuff on there. And then I would say Instagram. Instagram's at Mason Plumley. Yeah, just my name. It, it's my name for everything. But, um, you know, we have some fun stuff coming out in the next year. So so tune in, check it out. We'll, we'll have some some fun content. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for being on The Big Jump. Uh, this is so much fun to sit down with you and we'll have to do it again sometime. So thanks, man. You feel like a teammate. Awesome. Thanks, David. There are comprehensive show notes and links to everything and everyone mentioned in this episode at thebigjumpshow.com. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best. And I learned from sports that feedback is love and improves performance. So give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you. So tell me what you liked. Tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show. And leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean? Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports.